Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim and I'll be uh, hosting until prom. Get you the rest of your money involved with this stuff. I would like to, uh, while you guys are getting settled, I'd like to briefly go over the format of the college tonight. And that is the first part, we'll have a brief announcements period, followed by our main speaker, followed by a question and answer period, then followed by our infamous rebuttal period. So again, that'll be, the speaker will speak, the speaker will take questions, and then you get to rebut anything, whether it be about the subject matter or not. We have a speaker tonight. Really? A speaker who has spoken here before. A speaker who has been the facilitator of uh, many of our talks uh, with technical advice and uh, help. Uh, I give you Paul Rossino. Thank you, Brown, Charlie, fellow collegians. I'm here, as they said earlier, to speak about this book. I hope my speech inspires you tonight, and if you want to get a copy of your own, you can get it for $15 on, at Amazon. This book, the reason I picked it up and read it in the first place, it was put to me as a book that every American who cares about their freedom should read. And I can agree with that statement 100%. The book is written by Oz Guinness. Oz Guinness is an Irishman, visitor, of Ameri visitor to America, fond of America and Americans, concerned about our way of life. He is the great-great-grandson of Arthur Guinness, the Dublin Brewer. And right now he lives with his wife, Jenny, in McLean, Virginia. This book looks at some neglected issues in our country today. The deepest and most urgent of all as the Brahm said, sustainable freedom. What sustainable freedom means is freedom that goes on and on from generation to generation, from century to century, forever. Freedom of its own, freedom left to its own, will destroy itself because freedoms get abused and you end up with abuse of power, which leads into um, despotism and, and other evils that we're seeing a lot of today in our country. Freedom is the issue of issues for Americans. It is the one thing that really sets us apart. It defines us. It's our boast. It is the reason for the importance of America. We love our freedom supremely. Our country has a birthright of freedom. The revolution was fought for independence, for freedom. We have expanded, the country expanded because of freedom. Today, we are a world power pushing freedom out to the world. <laughs> but there's a paradox in freedom, as I was referring to. It is difficult to sustain because it is self-destroying. Freedom, freedom's worst enemy is freedom. <laughs> There's a historical challenge also. Free societies have been few and far between. There were only two really true free societies before the Americans came along. 
the Greeks with logos, and the Jews with the call of God to each person. The Romans owed much to the Greeks, but the Romans could hardly really be considered a free society. There's also a political challenge. which is maintained on in two different ways. The nation's constitution, which is the formal structure of the freedom, it's the laws, the background. And if it is well built and maintained, it can last forever. Also, freedom relies on the citizens' convictions. It's an informal spirit, the habits of the heart, which need to be reinvigorated generation to generation to generation forever. There's a fundamental moral challenge. Freedom requires order and therefore restraint, which is a bad word these days. And the restraint, restraint, restraint that is needed is self-restraint. You need self-restraint to keep your freedoms from going out of control. We live in a democratic republic, and in a democratic republic, the rulers and the subjects are one and the same. So the rules, the philosophies, and everything applies to everyone equally, whether you are in government or just the citizen. Freedom depends on the character of the nation's leaders and citizens. And this is a special, no, no requirement, there is no requirement to rise above private interests and remember the public good. And this is especially true in bitter, anxious times like we're having now. It is a core problem. There is a human propensity for self-love. Virtue to remain free is unnatural. Montesquieu said, self-renunciation needed for freedom is always a very painful thing. There is a natural bent of self-love in all people. You, you want to dominate, not restrain yourself. In America today, the private trumps the public. In consumerism we say, it's all about me. And then we tell the government to get off our backs. The conclusion is inescapable. Unbounded freedom simply cannot restrain itself by itself. Self-destructive tendencies will always show through. That is the paradox of freedom. Neither law nor virtue alone can sustain freedom. You need both. Freedom in ge generates abuse of power that endangers freedom unless it is checked and balanced. Law will override freedom because of the lack of self-restraint again. You compensate by replacing virtue with regulations. Virtue alone is too weak to sustain freedom. The theme of the book is the present crisis of America's ordered liberty and sustainable freedom. The crisis of freedom is the, ne the neglect of the notion of ordered liberty, which allows democracy to be durable and free people to stay free. The founders gave no name to this vision of sustainable freedom. Tocqueville called it the habits of the heart. Oz Guinness calls it the golden triangle of freedom. And we'll look into this a little further later on in the speech. There is an unchanging imperative of every political order to continue to be. No civilization 
is immune to the forces of decline. The founders address this issue shrewdly, and we pay scant attention to the flounders these days. Sustainable freedom that underlies their strength and prosperity. A sustainable society is self-renewing from generation to generation. Citizens choose to do what society needs them to do if it is to last. Leaders and citizens cultivate habits of heart and do without thinking what they need to do. This is not happening today. Everybody's worried about me and could care less about society or anyone else for that matter. The passion and goal of the revolution was always free, free always. The leaders of the revolution believed freedom would last forever. Nothing was more daring of a statement in that day. Free people can become free, live free, and remain free, be free forever. Americans today take freedom for granted. That we glorify how we became free, basking in how we enjoy freedom. And the superpower status, especially since the fall of the of the uh, Soviet Union, gives us an illusion of invulnerability. Times of dominance are the most dangerous because of that. Decline always follows domination. There are three tasks in establishing a free society. Winning freedom, ordering freedom, and sustaining freedom. Each is a consideration to the American founders. Winning freedom. The noblest and most glory of the three, glorious of the three. Easy, easily overshadows the others. Think about Fourth of July celebrations. We're celebrating winning freedom. It is our founding myth. It is almost like a religion to Americans. We fought the revolution. We won our freedom. The second task is ordering freedom. This is no less daring and significant. Pulling down, we need to pull down the oppressive structures and practices of the old regime. Successful revolutions create a vacuum of lethal ideas to which rep the rep for which the revolution was fought. People who would be free must be able to rule themselves. Free people need saving from themselves. 1776 in the revolution was winning freedom. 1787 and the Constitution was ordering freedom. Freedom requires peace. Peace requires personal as well as social order. The Constitution is a unique masterpiece of political design. It is not faultless because many of us realize it was inadequately handled religious liberty, the state's rights, and the evil of slavery. That is one of the reasons why the Bill, Bill of Rights was put in, to handle some of those issues. The Founders' writings proved order, ordered freedom and tempered liberty far beyond Philadelphia in 1787 and the Bill of Rights in 1791. It included the understanding of cultural foundation needed to foster freedom. The individual characters of the leaders suited to lead a free people. You do not want to lapse into despotism or corruption. Corruption is something near and dear to many of us in Chicago. <laughs> and a constitution is more than laws. Our constitution was designed to create a more perfect union. It is a framework 
which citizens, free citizens could live freely and peacefully. The Constitution is what orders freedom. Sustaining freedom is the hardest and least discussed today because we assume it. We take freedom for granted. We don't realize that it takes work to maintain freedom. We are more confident in an endless list of slogans, renewing the American dream, restoring the American promise. The best is yet to be. America's future will always be greater than her past, as if saying it could make it so. Sustainable is common in several fields, such as economic growth and development, and relations with the environment. Few Americans think about sustainable freedom. Most people don't realize the American experience is open-ending. It's ongoing and needs to be maintained. There are two ways anything can go, either advance or decline. So if you, we don't keep advancing, we will decline. Liberty is a marathon, not a sprint. The task of freedom requires vigilance and perseverance. The revolution, revolution's winning of freedom was eight years. The Constitution's ordering of freedom was 13 years. The challenge of sustaining freedom goes on to this day and will go on as long as it stands. I need to make a definition here. There are two types of freedom. There is negative freedom and positive freedom. Negative freedom is freedom from. Freedom from religion, freedom from oppression, freedom from whatever. Positive freedom is freedom for, mostly freedom for excellence, freedom for growth, freedom for. And you always have to have the two. If you favor one over the other, it doesn't work. You've got to have a balance between the two. That's Lincoln, President Lincoln said the Civil War was a clash between two freedoms. Negative freedom of the South and positive freedom of the North. The South wanted freedom from interference with slavery. The North wanted freedom for improvement. In contemporary America, we have voted for negative freedom rather than positive. We've exalted freedom as essentially a private matter, free from all outside interference. And the choice, as I was saying, is never either or. It's got to be a little bit of both if true freedom is to flourish. It always rests on two con conditions. Complete absence of any use of power, which is the essence of negative freedom, or a vision of positive way of life, which is the essence of positive freedom. In a free society, free citizens are prevent are free citizens are not prevented from doing what they should do, which is the de which would be the denial of positive freedom. And uh, they're also not forced to do what they should do, which would be the denial of negative freedom. The revolution won freedom the Constitution strengthened what the Revolution had secured. Freedom required independence. Liberty had to be preceded by liberation. Sustaining freedom. How can freedom be sustained? Constitution and separation of powers is critical. Though these days it seems to be ignored also. The rest of the Founders' solution is now almost ignored. Not always so. The Constitution was elevated starting in the 1930s. 
There was a general secularization of American law, which led to general legislation of American life. It had been preceded, in the preceding decades, legal contracts were strengthened and sharpened, taking place of weakening moral considerations, such as character and trust. My word is my bond. Separation of powers between executive, legislative, and judiciary, unquestionably distinctive and unique in the United States Constitution. But it wasn't the founders' complete solution. It originally included the rights and powers of local government to balance the powers of the states and the rights and powers of the states to balance the federal government. The entire dimension was seriously emasculated, starting with response to the Civil War, accelerating through deliberate centralization under progressives and depression era leaders, climaxing in the last decade. The unchecked growth of centralized federal government was the result of three things. The old evils such as slavery, new dangers such as terrorism made it necessary, new technologies and procedures allowed for a computerized bureaucracy which made it possible, and new idea, ideologies such as progressivism made it desirable. Freedom is maintained and assessed at two levels. The Constitution, which is the structure of liberty, and the citizens, which, is the, which are the spirits of liberty. Focusing solely on the separation of powers at level of Constitution, this is the slippage at levels of the citizens. Constitution's barriers are part of the answer. The, U, the U.S. Constitution was never meant to be the sole bulwark of freedom, let alone a self-perpetuating machine that would go by itself. Without strong ethics, the best laws and constitution would only be at ropes of sand. There's an irony here. Many educated people scorn religious fundamentalism while they are hard at work creating constitutional fundamental, fundamentalism. <laughs> The Golden Triangle of Freedom. This, I believe, is the heart and soul of this book. The Golden Triangle of Freedom. And he states it this way. Freedom requires virtue. Virtue requires faith. Faith requires freedom. And it's an unending triangle, just like the recycling triangle. Sustainable freedom depends on character of both the rulers and the ruled. And it is you need a vital trust between them. It's more than a matter of law. The Constitution was the foundational law of the land, supported and sustained by faith, character, and virtue of the entire citizenry. Place virtue alone with no virtue at all is madness. Leadership without character, business without ethics, science without human values, freedom without virtue will, will bring the republic to its knees. Some virtue rather than virtue alone, along with checks and balances, is always needed. Humans act politically, inspired by faith, virtue, courage, honor, excellence, justice, prudence, generosity, and compassion. Also self-interest, self-preservation, power, greed, vanity, revenge, and convenience. A wise government must take both sides into account. There are two strategies for a loss of virtue which have worked in the past, but will not work today. Mostly because virtue is completely ignored today. 
First, you can rely on a fake virtue, where lip service is paid to virtue, and this is basically hypocrisy. You give the appearance of virtue rather than virtue itself. This only works when real virtue is valued, and real virtue today is not valued. It must be valued and honored enough to imitate in flattery. And today in the U.S., virtue is hardly esteemed. Vice is often flaunted, as in greed is good. And there is no need for the hypocrisy. The second way is a form of pragmatic virtue, driven solely by the requirements of commerce. Functional virtue parallel to real virtues. Such virtues, once real and powerful in America, provided thrust to propel America to heights of economic prosperity. They lost strength in the contemporary world. They're un undermined by the empire of consumerism. Delayed gratif gratification sh shouldered aside by the clamor for instant grat gratification. Now, Many of you are probably asking the obvious question here. Whose virtue? Today, our age prizes toleration. Virtue, virtue crafts an itching to impose their values on others. The Golden Triangle indirectly links freedom to faith. But it it doesn't say which faith, it just says a faith. <coughs> There's a barrage of instant dismissal that blows dust in the eyes of anyone trying to take freedom and the founders seriously. You can say the founders were not politically serious, indulging in civic rhetoric for, rhetoric for occurrences such as the 4th of July. And say they refer to religion so often because they were children of their times. They lived at a time where much more that is much, that was much more religious than today. The founders knew from history and experience that the wrong relationship of faith and virtue to freedom had been and always would be disastrous, both for freedom and for faith. The American founders linked faith and freedom, republicanism and religion, not only deliberate and thoughtful, was surprising in anything but routine. The laws of the land provide external restraints on behavior, a matter of virtue, a matter of faith. Faith and virtue are indispensable to freedom, to liberty itself, to civic vitality and social harmony. They go hand in hand with freedom. The golden triangle must be stated with great care. Required, and freedom requires virtue, which requires faith, not a legal or constitutional requirement. The First Amendment flatly and finally prohibits the federal government in any established way. proper and <clears throat> positive understanding of disestablishment leads directly to the heart of the founders' audacity. The American Republic rice rests on ultimate beliefs. Otherwise, Americans have no right to the rights by which they thrive. He rejects any official orthodox formulation of what these beliefs should be. The Republic, our grand experiment, will always remain undecided experiment, and we will have to see if it stands or falls. By the dynamism of its entire voluntary non-established faiths. The framers did not believe the Golden Triangle was sufficient by itself to sustain freedom. Without complacency, safeguard of constitutional separation of powers. 
Madison warned, faith, character, and virtue were necessary, but not sufficient in themselves to restrain a majority from overriding the rights of a minority. Faith, character, and virtue, necessary and desirable, but are never sufficient by themselves, must be balanced by an immovable bulwark of constitutional rights, especially for those in the minority. Freedom requires virtue. The framers taught the importance of virtues. Mitt Romney, in December of 2007, asserted freedom requires religion. That is not what the founders claimed, nor how they expressed it. Freedom requires virtue, not religion. And virtue requires faith, not religion. There is a difference between religion and faith, but that's off time. The reason for this is simple and incontrovertible. Only virtue can supply the necessary self-restraint. It is an indispensable requirement for liberty. Unrestrained freedom undermines freedom. Any other restraint eventually becomes a contradiction of freedom. The founders went beyond general statements to specific applications such as the need to integrate virtue in both public and private life, the framers' insistence on the importance of character and leaders also. The golden triangle of freedom challenges rulers as much as those who are ruled. Today, character and virtue are dismissed as private issues. No amount of laws and regulations can make up for a lack of integrity in a leader. <coughs> the, the golden triangle is not sufficient, but necessary. In George Washington's farewell address in 1796, he stated, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. The words he used, supports, pillars, props, foundations, wellsprings, these all tell a story of how freedom requires virtue. Also, from his same address, would need, would need virtue to control the usual current of the passions or prevent our nation from running the course which has hitherto marked the destiny of nations. The framers' insistence on enforcing the virtue for freedom was squarely, is squarely against modern thinking. In a debate between negative freedom, freedom from interference, and positive freedom, freedom for excellence, the American Revolution struggled to gain negative freedom. The Declaration of Independence, the grandest and most influential statement of freedom from interference. The founders did not stop there. Equally committed to com complementary importance of freedom and for excellence, their aim liberty, not just independence. Were the, were the framers smuggling aristocracy of virtue back into the republic, therefore being undemocratic? In a sense, yes. The republic required leaders and citizens who took virtue seriously especially in highest national affairs. In a democratic republic such as the United States, citizens, the choice is not between aristocracy and no aristocracy. The choice is between aristocracy and democracy. And since we are in a re representative democracy, it is 
inevitably aristocratic in one sense. We have a few people who are elected to represent everyone else. The choice was made between a representative rather than pure or complete democracy as in Athens. If you rule out virtue as a criterion, something else will take its place. Most probably money or fame. Does that sound familiar? Money rather than more monarchy, plutocracy rather than theocracy. Chief chief threats are the chief threats to republicanism today. Without virtue there would be no freedom. Without virtue we hardly have citizens at all. It takes virtue to transform private concerns of individuals into public concerns of citizens who are willing and able to participate in common discussion of common good. Virtue requires faith. The Founders' position on religion was an open battleground. The Founders, not all the Founders were persons of faith. And they held a very different view of relationship of religion and public life. Evidence for what they argue is massive and unambiguous, even from unlikely sources such as Thomas Jefferson. Can, can the liberties of a nation be, be thought secure when we have removed their only basis, conviction in the morals of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they are violated but with his wrath. I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. And also Ben Franklin, if men are so wicked as we now see them with religion, what would they be without it? <laughs> the framers were not arguing for a Christian America. Not at all. At the time, the Christian religion was the best one they had available. And most of the people that lived in the colonies had some type of Christian background or knowledge. Here's another question that's probably bouncing around in a few heads here. What about atheists? Is there no freedom of conscience for atheists? The founders thought that atheists would not be good citizens. Because an, athe an atheistic or secularist worldview is a form of faith, especially is especially naturalistic and non-supernatural. And the framers were emphatic about a right of freedom of conscience or religious liberty, absolute, unconditional, and a matter of equity for all. No free and lasting civilization anywhere in history has so far been built on atheist foundations. The matter here is, if you have a faith, you have a faith in something or someone, that faith in this entity, we'll call it, gives you a moral obligation, which is where the virtue comes from. An atheist not having such a faith would have no motivation towards the virtue. Voltaire, who is hardly a religious person at all, said, I want my lawyer, my tailor, my servants, even my wife to be leaving God, because it means that I shall be cheated and robbed and coupled less often. 
By the virtuous Christians and believers. What a bullshit. How do you repeat the same shit? The evidence suggests the founders were utilitarian rather than cynical. They, they presume that faith would do the job of shaping virtue, and it was needed to promote and protect the Republican freedom. Yeah. President Jefferson, who was a deist and hardly had any like of organized religion, attended church faithfully while he was president. And here, when, when asked about this, here's what he said. No nation has ever yet existed or been governed without religion. The Christian religion is the best religion that has ever been given to men, and I, as chief magistrate of this nation, am bound to give it the sanction of my example. So he went to church every Sunday, not because he wanted to, but because he felt, he, as the President of the United States, he needed to set a good example for the rest of the people. Faith requires freedom. The third leg of the golden triangle is the most radical. The first two legs challenge unexamined assumptions of liberals. The third does the same for many conservatives. Nothing in the American experiment is more revolutionary than the first 16 words of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The burden of centuries of oppression were lifted. Faith, faith was put on its feet. And this was no bolt out of the blue. It was a crowning achievement of the long, slow, torturous path to religious liberty and grew out of the horrors of wars of religion. Without coming to terms of, with freedom of conscience, Islam cannot, be, cannot modernize peaceably, Europe cannot advance freely, and America will never fulfill the promise of its great experiment in freedom. The First Amendment is all about liberty, liberty for all, best remedy for countering extremism by some, the good of the republic is not far away. <coughs> Can the U.S. be a superpower worthy of free people? There are four tests in this arena of international standing. America must prove its mettle on each of these or fail as another passing form of empire. The first is, can American leaders articulate America's role as, world's, as a world's extreme power? We are concerned with universal liberty. The American economic and military dominance is not in question, at least not yet. The issue is, America is accompanying political wisdom that is triggering strong responses to American's exercise of its dominant power. America's relationship to freedom and global diversity has grown far less clear in the last, de last decade. America's attempts to assert its sole superpower strengths unilaterally have caused disquiet and anger around the world, called into question what America means by freedom, and what America, what America means to the world, to much of the world, the U.S. is increasingly unwanted and irrelevant. Once an extraordinary nation, the U.S. has behaved like ordinary empire. <laughs> the second test. Americans need to show that it has learned the lessons of imperialism. Will America follow a different course? The first stage of empires, which parallels winning of freedom, is the expansion of the empire. 
This is fired by dynamism and an unbounded faith and spirit of its vision. The second stage is parallel to ordering freedom, that is inclusion, that is making the places you've expanded to a part of your company, country, a lot like assimilation. The third stage, which is parallel to sustaining freedom, is to keep the um, empire from failing from overextension through empire creep. You make wider and wider commitments until overwhelmed by the impossibility of sustaining them all. It is easy to gain an empire. No empire can hold it all together forever. It becomes too large to rule, too diverse to unite, too expensive to afford, and too far flung to defend. The real loser is the American citizen deprived of the benefits of prosperity. We should have created a better and more just society at home than worrying about what's going on around the world. There are three awkward facts confronting Americans today. First, Americans have characteristically short memories and even shorter political cycles. We act in sharp contrast to the founders, display an ignorance of history and world, of, and the world, which is a fading handicap to lasting dominance. Second, Americans do not have willingness to assume long-term costs of dominance, militarily, economically, or in the lives and blood of young men and women. Third, Americans thrive on doctrinaire optimism. This is a serious weakness when it comes to living wisely within realistic limits in a fallen world. The U.S. faces broad options to overcome these challenges. Open possibility of enduring few influences. First, face them squarely and renounce universalizing mission. Second, drift blindly toward disastrous schizophrenia. As America remains economically and militarily engaged all around the world, it grows more and more The third test show that Americans can avoid peril of all dominant powers in relation to the rest of the world and blindness the Greeks called hubris. It's far more than simple pride. So overweening arrogance and presumption it creates an illusion of invulnerability and leads to a tragic downfall. From first, first grows conceit, illusion, that what is good for a superpower is automatically good for the rest of the world. From such conceit grows fatal hubris, the illusion that empire can afford to treat human beings elsewhere differently than its own citizens. If rule of law is fundamental to America, it must be fundamental for Americans across the world. The fourth test, to show that America has heeded the warning by the last great empire to stand where the U.S. stands today. The history of empires is more than the story of one damn superpower after another. Each one rises and falls according to its own distinctive faith and foil, its own nationalistic faith and foil of its enabling enemy, the legendary other. The faith, faith of the Greeks, foil of the Persians, faith of the Romans, foil of the Carthaginians, Spain to the Medes, British to the French and Spanish, America at first to the British, later to the Nazis and Communists, now to radical ism. Is this antiquarian only? The weight of history must surely lead to pessimism. Or is the reverse the case? Without wisdom of the path, there is no sure way to the future. What will be the outcome when America's story today becomes the history of America tomorrow? Will the U.S. join the ranks of superpowers, pay the ransom for its overreach, its neglect of history, 
by falling from power to powerlessness in a generation or two? Or will American heed, Americans heed the lessons of history, stave off decline through genuine movement of revival, of renewal? A happier outcome is a realistic possibility for those who share the Founder's hope of sustainable freedom. The key here is what the author calls renewal. It's not a revival in a religious sense. It's a renewal in the sense of going back to what made this country great. Going back to what the Founders intended. Taking our lessons from history. We all know the saying, those who don't learn from history tend to repeat it. And the same thing is happening in our great nation. There are three essential tasks of durable freedom is to last. First, Americans must strongly and determinedly restore civic education. Education for liberty. Citizens of free society are born free, not born to equal freedom. Need to make people fittest to choose the fittest to govern. Second, Americans must strongly and determinedly rebuild its civic public square, leading to profound resolution, profound resolution of current cultural warring, reopening of public life to people of all faiths and none, citizens able to play a part in thriving society and robust democracy. Third, Americans must strongly and determinedly reorder grand spheres that would make up American society its powerful influence on the world, key features of modern world differentiation, and the process by which the modern world reinforces. We must go forward by first going back. The notion of restoration needs restoring. The classical notion of renewal through return to the past that is progressive. Herein lies the difference between cultural progress and scientific progress. Science builds on the past, but never refers to it. Cultural progress can be animated by generations returning to the past. When it comes to ideas, it is possible to turn back the clock. The two most progressive movements in Western history, the Renaissance and the Reformation, were both results of returns to the past in very different ways with very different outcomes. A return to the past can be progressive, not reactionary. Each movement in its own way goes forward by first going back, back to the basics. Not mindless espousal of the present, breathless chase after some reported future, most creative remakings are most faithful rediscoveries. When religious or political beliefs become tired and lose vigor, it's a way to reinvigorate them is not to modernize or rebrand them cosmetically, but to return to the source that gave them the, the but return to the source that gave rise to them in the first place. Is American Republic exempt from the need for such renewal? Will American leaders rise with enough humility and courage to lead the way to, to wise and robust return to the past? Okay. Well, thank you, Paul. Ready for questions? I don't know if I'm ready, but it's time. All right. Now, you have uh, heard a good deal of the philosophy of uh, the uh, Guinness book. Question over there. Yes, we have a question from Don, Don Ritchie. Um, what you use the word? Virtual 
So my understanding from reading the book, of the virtue is doing what is right and good. Who decides who decides what's right? The uh, people as a whole. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, people will decide. Yes. Tim? I am at a quandary right now because, you know, you talk about the decline of the American empire. I mean, couldn't it have other causes besides the lack of moral character? Like, for example, um, you know, the unsustainability of the federal deficit or maybe the lack of a good power source or maybe the fact that we're losing our uh, moral ground with our economic system. In the book he addresses these matters and he says that if we would follow these methods that I explained tonight, it would help to bring solutions to those problems. I could not, of course, tell you the whole book here tonight, but in the book, it does address that that very question, and it said his point on that is that if if we were all following the tenets laid out here, it would help to enable the solutions to those problems. So, as a follow-up, what's an atheist to do? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. Loud, yes, please. Tom Barry. One. Uh, you have, you have a, you put it this way, and you, you recognize that the best time is when you can buy. Ah! Yeah. yeah. And if you, if you were following along, that's one of the things he, he mentions indirectly, and he says that's part of the problem because money is replacing virtue, and that leads to downfall. Well, if we had the best time is when you can buy, how is virtue going to change that? If we had the most virtuous Congress, instead of the best Congress money could buy, we would all be better off. What if we got the money out of the Congress? What was that? What if we get the money out of the Congress? You have, there has to be some reason why people are elected. Is it because we like them a lot? That would be the fame thing. Is it because they have the best sponsors, they have the most money, so they get elected, which is pretty much what goes on these days. <laughs> or are we picking the, pers the best person for the job? If we went out and put, picked the best, most virtuous person for the job, the job would probably get done a lot better. Yeah, but the problem is, we have, we're going along with the most money buys all the airtime. Right. That maybe, maybe we need to change the system of, of how that's done. <laughs> Yes, uh, Charlie? Yeah, I was under the impression we have an awful lot of virtue in the United States. It's called the United States Code of Law. And what in the world do you think that is? And the regulations that emanate from it. And all the other state and local laws that conform with that U.S. Code. That was sort of standards of virtue that we decided to affect. The author drew a distinction between virtue and law. That law has replaced virtue. Yeah. But the problem with that is, if you don't have virtue, your laws mean very little. Because non-virtuous people could care less about your laws. What is that supposed to mean? Yeah. Law. Okay. Let's let's go let, let's go back a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the judge there. When we were talking about <laughs> yes, but if we had people of virtue, the judges wouldn't have so much to do these days. Because people would people of virtue want to do what's right. They want to do what's good. So you don't need a law to tell them to do it. If I can make a libertarian statement, you cannot, you cannot legislate morality. So virtue comes from being religious? No. So, so? No. The point he makes is you need faith, not necessarily religion. What is faith? It's not religion. You can legislate what? morality, you thou shalt not kill. Irrational thinking, yeah. Uh, Have you ever heard of law against manslaughter? 
Uh, but does that law, has that law stopped people from killing each other? Yeah, quite a few of them have called death row. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, does the, does the author or you uh, address the, um, one of the things the founders worried about was that the free press would be unrestrained? We seem to have a problem today with the uh, concentration of uh, wealth uh, uh, restricting the free press by uh, accumulating power and controlling media outlets. In, in a general sense, the author does address unrestrained freedom, not particularly to the press, but just in, in general. Unrestrained freedom, he says, is the, is the bane of freedom. Because unrestrained freedom leads to sorry. unrestrained freedom takes advantage of itself because you keep saying, I can do anything I want, but when you're doing anything you want, you're doing things that maybe somebody else doesn't want. And unrestrained freedom um, leads to corruption and despotism. But restraining of the free press is different from, from that. Okay. He, he didn't refer to the press at all. In the okay, book. all right. Okay. Behind you. Well, I keep waiting for the punchline so I didn't get it. Uh, 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 from the board here. Uh, 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 they headed toward uh, Gold Bridge. Uh, uh, they uh, headed uh, toward the uh, uh, begins uh, and uh, the spectrum here. Uh, you never address that. Well, I didn't write the blurb. I wouldn't have put that. It, it is mentioned in the book that America is headed towards the not having any virtue at all. And if that should happen, it would be the end of three This is one of the. Oh, 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 it's the spirit. It's, it's, it's in here. In here, yeah. It's the people. The people make virtue. Yeah. People make virtue. You know people. Right? Well, Actually, that sounds right. real Chinese. It's called Taoism. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Some bullshit. Uh, 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 right. And like, like I said, I haven't been able to get the whole book here. So. If you were to sum up in about three minutes, the central prospect of the book, what would it be? The basis of the book is we need the laws, we need the Constitution, we need the separation of powers because that blocks the abuse of powers. We also need, well, to put it the way the author put it, with the golden triangle of freedom. Freedom requires virtue. Virtue requires faith, any faith. And faith requires freedom, because without the freedom to have the faith, you're not going to have the faith. And without the faith, there is no, no motivation to be virtuous. And without the virtue, the whole freedom thing corrupts itself. That's the heart and the soul of the book, the way I read it. Charles, what? I'm trying to frame the question. You talked about the Civil War. Okay, and the north and the south, and I thought the, the south is because uh, they wanted states' rights. Is that like a maybe a direct conflict of the way the Constitution was set up? Is that, is that why we had to, I, I just I just brought up the, the author brought up the Civil War as that one little quote from Abraham Lincoln to show to demonstrate negative and positive freedom. And that's all that was really mentioned in the book. Oh, very Norman. By faith, uh, is he referring to strictly some form of religious faith? Or is he going on that? Are you saying that to be virtuous, one must have some religion? The way he puts it is any faith. Any faith. Not really. <laughs> what he says is the, the, the faith, your faith in whatever. 
Okay. Gives you the motivation to be virtuous. The faith so it could be a faith in, in, in a philosophy or a governmental system or a leader. Yeah. Or a, yeah. 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 Because he said that's, a, in, in a large extent, that's what we're going to do. We have faith in the Constitution. The, the laws, the Constitution are becoming our God in this country, in a sense. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Chuck. Oh, oh. 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 Charles, do you have another question? Yeah, it, it's been said a thousand years from now, the only thing that the United States will be recognized for is the First Amendment. And this guy comes along and says something, the First Amendment rests upon belief. What part of no religion doesn't he understand? I'll stop with you. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty clear, isn't it? I don't think he ever said anything against the first religion, First Amendment. Yeah, the First Amendment, the rest of my belief, whatever that's supposed to mean, I don't know. Where did you get that from? I didn't Whoa. say that. I didn't say that. Okay. Well, maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Charlie thinks you should. The First Amendment is... The First Amendment is what allows us to have the beliefs I've, that right. provide the virtue, that I'll, support the freedoms. I'll, I'll rephrase it this way. I've read that a thousand years from now, the only thing the United States can recognize for is government without religion or faith. That's going to be the hallmark of our contribution to mankind. I don't think that's what the First Amendment means. It just means Congress, Congress shall set up more official religion. Not that the people shall not have any religion, but that the government shall be free of religion, just that there shall be no official religion. And, and the Constitution, I, I believe the author makes this point. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, is controlling the government, not the people. All right, uh, Bob uh, Virtue is a, <clears throat> a trait of uh, excellence in a person. Uh, and what is excellence, though, is decided by society. But in our society, since it's near crisis in all ways, I think uh, even excellence is in doubt. There's excellence we preach. But we're a bunch of hypocrites. There's well, that's one of the points the author made. Yeah. Especially like in world affairs, we say, oh, we're so big on laws, but we go and break all the laws we uphold when we go abroad. Oh, yeah, we preach helping others, but we practice sheer greed, you know. <clears throat> but, uh, see, so uh, virtue is a very problematic notion, but uh, even with a common sense notion is the goody-goody stuff. What does the beer man or you say about um, how to develop virtue other than having faith? Faith doesn't cut it. I mean, he doesn't say faith in what. I, I, would, I would think it would be faith in ideas or faith in yourself. Or well, his in... main premise of the solution is to learn from history, to go back to the principles that the founding father. But no, nobody... I'm talking about virtue. How do, you, how do we develop virtue? It doesn't Can say in the. <laughs> Okay. Thank you for saying we got a problem. Wait, wait, wait. One thing, one thing he did mention on it. In the, in, he mentioned a lot about re, refining the school system. We need to have strength in our public schools so that we can make raise children who would know how to interact in a free society, to choose, give them the knowledge to be able to select the best leaders. It's a big order, and we're going down well, I understand. The we're going I understand. The he, 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 he says it, the solution is not simple, but... Okay. Mr. Cole, Bob's right, dead on. Virtue doesn't cut it. What I see uh, that would cut it is uh, a word I would call enthusiasm but enthusiasm for the American system, which can be translated as patriotism. I don't see a long, strong strength of enthusiasm for government, for civic life, anymore. 
we become a very hedonistic country. The renewal of virtue that you're looking for is the renewal of patriotism. And the one place that I see it, believe it or not, uh, parallels the same place as education, and that's immigrants. This is a question, Mr. Fong. Hmm? Uh, this is a question, period. Uh, your rebuttal might come okay. later. Okay. Yeah, with what he was saying, that, that's what I was trying to say with the schools. The schools need to teach the patriots this, and they need to oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. But it's not, it's not happening. I love my flag. I got my flag. Well, he was referring to the public schools. And that's why the public schools, the public school, that's why the public schools were founded in the first place, to teach the children how to be good citizens. Uh, one of them, the facts of life and uh, how to uh, get ahead. But that's all part of being a good citizen. Okay. Uh, the business of life. Okay. If there are not other questions, uh, we can move to the rebuttal yeah, period. Cool. Let's thank our speaker, Paul. Uh, yeah. Of you all are ready or willing uh, to address the rest of us and enlighten us. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You missed two over here. This is one of you as if you can't wait to it. Brown, go about five minutes. All right. Well, but, all right. Five minutes because there'll be more. Five minutes. Uh, somebody might be moved to raise their hand. Okay. All right, let's get this uh, thing. I was reading too much. So, Mayor, uh, I want to thank our speaker, Paul Rashino, for giving an excellent review of Oz Guinness book. In the process, I think I identified both the uh, mentor, the historical mentors of Oz Guinness and Paul. And I identified those historical mentors as uh, Dr. Pangloss, uh, Voltaire, uh, Giordano Bruno, George H.W. Bush, um, and Bob Manner. <laughs> Um, I'd like to deal with a few of the things that Paul mentioned. First of all, the separation of powers was not an idealistic attempt to uh, control um, abuse of power. Uh, actually, it was from the fear of the people that they actually they in in instituted the separation of powers. You recall the original Constitution and the one that was passed in 18, uh, 1787 made arrangements for the uh, president to be elected by not the people, but by the electoral college. They were afraid of that. Um, you could only vote if you owned property in the 13 original states. And uh, the Senate was appointed by the governors of the individual states. But there were no people involved in it. They were not afraid of the abuse of power, they were afraid of each other. Yeah. And that's why they did that. Um, the founders were very wealthy people. They owned lots of land in the, in the middle and southern uh, eastern United States. Um, they owned slaves. They had great tri trade with the uh, with European countries in their cotton and other export, while the northern <coughs> part of the country dealt in manufacturing, mostly in textiles, which competed directly with the uh, more modern uh, manufacturing processes in England. Um, so they had to undercut the prices by uh, exploiting work there. Um, the laws in the United States and my mentor, Albert Weisbord, who made a very extensive study of this, 
during his term as a uh, student and uh, at Harvard Law School. Um, the, the, our laws come from Rome and our laws um, come from roughly 1500 to 1800 England. It's a compilation of the, the laws uh, that, you, that, that Rome used to govern the world and its own citizens and uh, the laws that were instituted by uh, England in its uh, monarchy. Um, the Bill of Rights, it's strange when you think about it. The Constitution was finally passed in 1887, but the Bill of Rights, the first, bill of, uh, the, first of the Ten Amendments, wasn't passed until 1791. That's four years after the institution of the government. Uh, why, why is that? And the last amendment was not passed until 1813. That's a long time for the Bill of Rights to uh, flounder, if you will, because the government that was formed under the protest of some of the uh, southern and uh, western states at that time did not include the uh, the rights that we take for granted now, the, the, the first ten amendments and the subsequent amendments. So there was a great fear among the people uh, who founded this country, not only of each other, of themselves, but also of the people. Okay. Next. Good evening. I'd like to say that I agree with almost everything our speaker had to say. Uh, by the way, Mr. Racino, who was holding a knife on you? <laughs> you talked like somebody was threatening your life with a knife. When you talk, speak up, man. Put a boom in your voice. You gave, you are a perfect example of the worst speaker that I have ever heard in this place. No personal attack. And what, what hurts yeah. me, I'm not personally attacking you, I'm trying to help you. You have the makings of being a really good speaker. Take a lesson from Rush Limbaugh. At least he makes it interesting. At least he makes it interesting. Shut up! At least he makes it interesting. And by the way, public education was started so that we would have an informed electorate not to make good little citizens. And that's all I have to say. Paul, I know you worked on this speech real hard. And it's probably the first time that you have done an extensively long presentation like this. There was a lot of material and a lot of uh, things that you had to cover. I know it's hard to deliver in front of an audience like this, but I challenge any of you to do the same thing. I challenge any of you to do the same thing. What you may not know about Paul is he's right now president of Fox Valley Postmasters and is actively seeking betterment of his skills. Tonight he came up here and presented a book and presented, tried to do his best to get in front of a crowd. He may not have gone off very well, but the fact that he had tried and that he had done the best he could with what he had should be applauded. Now I encourage any of you to try this again. It's not an easy thing. So please, before you criticize, try it. You'll see exactly what I mean. I wasn't going to comment because it didn't deserve any response to the speaker, but to what he said now, this, this uh, Tim Bolger, the purpose of the speech is not to be presenting a good presentation, is to make sense and to say things that you know something about and that they make people understand or learn something. But 
to present something because you went to the Toastmaster. No, I never it's said not, that. It, that's what you implied I, because yeah, he made the time. effort. Because the effort that should be uh, commemorated, uh, you know, prize. And, and, and you are making the point that I've been making it to you many times that because you went to the Toastmasters and you are capable to sit down and, and, and blubber something, doesn't mean that you make any sense. Good evening, everyone. I myself actually enjoy the talk. The only criticism I have was that perhaps it could have been a little shorter, but that's all. And I thought that, in fact, some very good ideas were stated. We heard much about civic virtue in that talk, and I heard several skeptical comments made about, well, where does virtue come from? And does it come from religion or Christianity or whatever? Horseshit. <laughs> Virtue can come from any number of sources. Christianity or Judaism, the religion I subscribe to, uh, being just one of them. It can come from reading Plato. It can come from studying Frank Lloyd Wright. It can come from reading the environmental works of Aldo Leopold. It can come from any, any wellspring of ideas that you happen to subscribe to, any one of you. And civic virtue is something that's been sadly lacking in this country for a very long time. When I was a boy, when I was growing up, we used to have presidents in this country like Dwight Eisenhower or John Kennedy. People who believed in, in, in people who had some belief in civic virtue, and people who believed in public service, and people who believed in using power not for its own sake, but for what they could do with it. And now it seems to be government by greed is good, or at least that is often the case. And to stand up there and sneer at civic virtue and to say, well, if it, didn't, if it isn't religion, it isn't civic virtue, whatever, that plays just right into the hands of, of the greed is good crowd. What the summary of Oz Guinness's book, which I haven't read and which I'm now going to, most reminds me of is a book that came out about 40 years ago. It was written by Chief Justice Earl Warren. The book was called A Republic If You Can Keep It. Now, the sophisticated critics sneered at this book, and they said, well, it's corny and it's sentimental and blah, blah, blah. Only problem is there is a corny and sentimental audience out there, at least to some extent. Uh, for books of that sort. I should know. I brought a copy and I read it. I've still got it. It was one of the best books I ever read. But then what the hell, I'm a corny and sentimental guy and what do I know? Yeah. Thanks, honey. I want to say that uh, I appreciate the speech. I appreciate the effort uh, that you put into it. You obviously read it. I uh, read it deeply huh? about it. Twice. Yeah, I could tell, all right? And I appreciate that. I'd also say that the virtue you're, str you're struggling to define really is patriotism, civic virtue, civic enthusiasm. And I left my flag at home, please, come on. That's what's going to be our downfall. A sentiment like that is a lack of civic virtue. That's all I have to say. But in certain ways, the way you were approaching virtue, I was just laughing, but at myself. Okay, because I, uh, being Chinese, uh, I, just, I dove into my heritage and I went into my own religious heritage. And Taoism was one of them, and uh, it's pretty mystical. It's stuff like uh, the definition of a leader, of a good leader, is he who governs best governs least. You know, but that assumes that the people who's leading, he was leading, have virtue. And he doesn't have to slap them upside the head. They just know what to do. But then it's very mystical. It's very Zen. It's very Tao. It's, the Tao is almost ineffable. The Tao is almost indescribable. And I think that this country needs something like that, okay? Uh, it's been said, and I totally believe it, that this country, without immigrants, with their level of education, without them, our economy would just sink, because the education system is just now so deficient. 
in a parallel way, I think our civic virtue is also parallel, is also deficient in a parallel way. We need to redo little both. Both currents cross feed each other. I think that would be the beginning of virtue, however mystical and ill-defined or hard to define that it is. Thank you. Thank the courage of our speaker for getting up here and making his presentation. He said something anybody knows. I don't always agree with everything. I think the problem we have with our country is our Congress. And I think the problem we have with our Congress is we have the best money Congress can buy. The best Congress money can buy. And uh, that's, that's a real problem. That has to change. And before anything you brought up about virtue or anything else is going to work, we've got to change that Congress. It's not going to be by electing somebody that's got virtue. It's going to be by getting the money out of Congress. And the only way I know how to do that is maybe to offer Congress the, to get Congress to act in its own self-interest, to instruct the Federal Communications Commission to require the media to provide sufficient free airtime, the airways are free, for federal candidates in general the elections, there are their view in the elections. Now, if you did that, you would eliminate a lot of problems. Congress might even vote for it because they get to keep their money plus they vote for free and they get free airtime. They wouldn't have to spend all that time raising money, which they shouldn't be doing anyway. So this might help in the direction of that happening. Now then, after that happened, then we might get to our real problem. Part of our real problem today is, is we have a... Today, today in America we have, I think it's 30, 35, 25 million people who are unemployed or underemployed. Wages are declining. One in, one in four mortgages is underwater. And, two pe and four people are looking for every available job. That's the situation we have today in America. It's not good. Uh, moreover, U.S. job loss in the, in the last decade is worse than any decade since the 1890s. Uh, one third of the unemployed have been out of work for over a year, which is in half over six months. This is even higher than any time in the 1930s Great Depression. That's a true fact. Uh, we have to take effective action to put our nation back to work and to put purchasing power back in the hands of, of working people. This is what has to happen. Uh, reducing the workday, which is something that will happen someday, it's a question of when, I'm a believer that maybe we can reduce from eight hours to six hours. We go to a 30-hour week instead of a 40-hour week. We could re-employ 25 million people. We could have more people paying taxes. We'd have less people draining taxes. The government get a two-fold benefit of increased tax revenue, not raising taxes. We'd have less bills to pay for people that aren't working because they'd be working. We could revive the economy. This is what has to happen because if you analyze history and you analyze what's happened in this country, you'll find that. Since the Industrial Revolution, machines replace people. Machines haven't paid taxes. People pay taxes. When you put people out of work, they don't pay tax. They become tax creators instead of taxpayers, and that's what's happened. And that's why our country is in the trouble that it's in, and that's why we're going downhill instead of uphill. And that's what we have to change. So I don't want to bore you with a lot of trouble, but that's essentially what I have to say. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know how many of you knew this or not, but I happen to be an atheist. Oh. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Right. Right. So. So I just want to. Right. And. Uh, I, I heard a lot of remarks. I, I thought Frank might say something, you know, because uh, Frank is, you know, Frank is a fellow atheist like me, and I thought Frank might say something about all the, um, all this talk I heard tonight about, about how, um, oh, you can't, oh, you can't have virtue without faith, or, or this, these, these quotes that supposedly come from the founding, the founding fathers, guys like Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, saying that. 
with Voltaire supposedly saying that, and I never heard any of those quotes before, saying that 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 you know supposedly that religion makes people more virtuous. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any evidence that religion makes people more virtuous. I, I don't know if y'all have, but I sure the, I sure the hell have. And um, I'll tell you something else though. This idea that if you that that if you're not if, if that if you're not a person of faith, which it really Really, you know, con um, conservatives use the word faith as a, as a kind of, oh, excuse me, oh, I'm sorry, Tom. They use it as a kind of euphemism for religion. That the idea that, that, if you're not, that if you're not religious, that somehow you're not a good citizen, that you're not a real American. That's but, you know what, that's a bunch of bullshit, you know. Uh, I'm an atheist, and I'm just as much of an American as anybody else in this room, you know. And, and frankly, when, when people, you know, go and start saying, oh, you know, you're, you know, you're not as good as I am because you're an atheist. I, I consider that an insult. I, I find that very rude and very insulting. You say that, you don't know who's in the room. Because, you know, can you tell by looking at a person that they're an atheist? I mean, I, you, you can't see the horns growing out of my head. But I mean, you know. Uh, right, right. So, so, yeah, I find that, I, frankly, I find that, very, I find that very insulting. And I'm sure you wouldn't like it if I came out and told you that I think there's something wrong with you because you're a Christian. So that's all I have to say on the subject. I want to applaud uh, our speaker uh, for the information he's given us. Use the microphone. Uh, he's brought out some uh, questions that we all need to uh, think about. Uh, and sometimes it's more important to ask the questions than it is to come up with the answers. Uh, we've all been given free will. I'm going to throw you in a completely different loop, and I want to remind you that the game is not poker, but bridge. <laughs> <laughs> now, in poker, you're playing by yourself. <coughs> in bridge, you have a partner. Now, if that partner is all-powerful, all-knowing, has your best interests at heart, why not let him drive? You change people's hearts, and you'll change his work. Thank you. I'm Michael Foley. No kidding. <laughs> Uh, because of the topic tonight, I just feel I have to speak, but I'm not really sure what to say. The topic the speaker presented, this presentation was really, really very thorough and very deep, and I'm really glad I was here to hear it. And I can't criticize or complain about it because I agree with almost much of everything he said. I was also very happy that I was here tonight to witness the raw savagery that was on display up here. Anyway, the speaker was criticized for not talking loud enough. I've been criticized in the past for talking too loud when I get up here. <laughs> so, as I've said to other people before, in other forums and other meetings, just exactly what level is the speaker supposed to speak at? I've actually been criticized for talking too softly in other forums and all. But anyway, I'm glad I was here to witness the savagery. Anyway, I do want to thank the speaker because the presentation was very thoughtful and very thorough. I think that in this country we are long past what he has been talking about. I am a doomsday guy. And I have said before that we are living through the end of the world. We have been living through the end of the world for quite some time now. I'll just mention two things. During his talk, a lot of what his talk was involved about had to do with the public, the masses of people being involved in their government on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's almost impossible in this country. There are many, many millions of people in this country that do have thoughtful and intelligent things to say about how their government should act, 
but there's really no way to to express themselves in a, in an effective way. You can go to a politician's office, an elect, any elected official, you can go to any elected official's office, and the only way the guy will pay any attention to you is if you walk into his office with $100,000 in your hand, and you say, this is a campaign contribution. Then the guy will pay attention to you. Otherwise, all you get to do is talk to the secretary and just say, please write a letter or send an email. Also, to talk about freedom in the United States of America really doesn't make much sense because we don't have freedom in this country. As far as elections, the reason we have elections is we are allowed to pick the people who are going to oppress us. <laughs> That's what an election is about. If you think you've got freedom in this country, just got, try to get on an airplane. <laughs> You have to ask permission from a guy with a tin badge and a gun. You have to submit to an interrogation by a guy with a tin badge and a gun. And if you're a good-looking woman, you got to take your clothes off. You're subject to strip search just to get on an airplane to go to California on vacation. Now, if you don't like the way, or, or if, you got, if you don't like the way something is run by our government, or if you think you've got a way to improve what our government might do, just go downtown in a federal building and try to talk to some public official there. Same thing. You have to ask permission of a guy with a tin badge and a gun. You have to submit to an interrogation by a guy with a tin badge and a gun. And you might be strip searched by a guy with a tin badge and a gun just because you want to go talk to a government employee. We have no freedom in this country. We have an illusion of freedom. They like to tell us we're free people and all that BS. But we live in a military dictatorship. <laughs> I've had people talk to me about this and that, and people say, oh, this is a police state. This is getting to be a police state. It's not. We live in a military dictatorship. We don't have trucks loaded with soldiers driving up and down the street, although I do believe that's coming. It's all got to do with what's going on in Michigan Avenue now with young groups of criminal felons running up and down Michigan Avenue attacking people and stealing from them. That is meant to soften people up, the rich people and the rich store owners, to get them to start screaming about send the National Guard to Michigan Avenue. But anyway, we don't have truckloads of soldiers driving up and down the streets yet, but we have truckloads of soldiers who are dressed in police officer uniforms and other such type of uniforms. Even people at the airport that are searching us, I mean, they're soldiers, they're not wearing military uniforms. There are, we have been shown on TV, there are police officers walking around O'Hare Field with machine guns, John Wayne style. That's because there's terrorists trying to get on all our airplanes and blowing up and all that BS. But we do live in a military dictatorship. We have no freedom. And if you want to try to in any way say anything thoughtful to any elected official, the only way to do it is to give them a $100,000 campaign contribution. And again, I'm thankful that I was here to hear the speaker talk. It was a very good talk. One line that, one line that he said that I picked out. No amount of laws make up for a lack of integrity in a leader. That sentence applies to what's going on in our government, all levels of government. There aren't any people of integrity holding elective office in this country today, not even one. If there was a guy who had some integrity who was elected to public office and he stayed for longer than six months I'd say, well, you're asleep, buddy. If the guy stayed for one term, whether it was two years, four years, or six years, and said, I've had it, this is bullshit, I'd say, well, okay, you served out one term. But anybody who is elected to public office and runs for re-election has absolutely no integrity. The guy's out for his bribe money and his women, 
That's what they're there for, to get money and to get sex. And the fact that they run for re-election means they love it and they want it, and they have absolutely no integrity. There is no integrity among elected officials in our country today. Thank you. Um, I, I, it is a hard thing to prepare any kind of a presentation in front of this group. The last time I did it was several years ago, and it took me really a long time. Um, but um, I guess um, I, um, I'm sure you gave a good uh, summary of the book um, as you read it, but it really didn't, some of it didn't, particularly historically, didn't have a lot of. Um, reference to what actually happened. The things that quotes about Thomas Jefferson and stuff are really inaccurate. If you go back and look at actual original comments, um, Jefferson and Adams and um, that dirty little atheist, quote unquote, Thomas Paine, and um, that's a direct quote from someone actually. And um, the, the, the rest of the founding fathers, or many of the founding fathers, were in fact deists, which were not people who really had faith in a god. They thought that maybe God created everything and then went away somewhere because it was boring or something. I mean, I don't know. But it didn't have anything to do with what was actually going on in the world that people, in fact, needed to take the, um, that people needed to determine what went on in the world. And that their quotes about religion were really not very um, uh, admiring of religion. Uh, that Christianity led to laziness and, and corruption among the priests and, uh, and docility and, um, and basically sheep behavior among the believers. That they followed things without any thought at all because the priest said that or the minister said it. So, um, you know, it, it was like it didn't have any real reference to what the real American history was. So, um, I had the same kind of response that um, Don did to the business about atheism, because I don't think virtue arises from faith, and I don't think that people are good or correct or are um, do the right thing because a God tells them to because that really is um, you know just just think of it that the people who are Christian do the right thing because they'll either be punished if they don't do if they do a bad thing and they'll be rewarded if they do the right thing so they're not doing it because it's right they're doing it because of some, um, what, some mythical uh, future reward or punishment because of what they're doing. So that's really not very virtuous, I don't think. So um, at any rate, um, I guess um, we have the government that we deserve because we don't inform ourselves about what's going on because we don't hold our politicians' feet to the fire so that we have public education that really does help our children to be able to think uh, critically about what's going on, to give them the facts and information that they need to make good decisions. We don't have a government that provides, and I'm really not a libertarian, um, that provides for general health care so that people will be adequately, um, that will be healthy enough to make decisions um, and that the things that go on are not for, to serve the purpose of the people who control um, the wealth of the country but are, are in fact done because they are actually virtuous and good things and for the people who for the general uh, population, for the public good, not because it um, increases profits of people who have money. So that's my diatribe. All right, Charlie. All right, yeah. I'm going to run all over.
over the place here. <laughs> Let us begin by, first of all, thanks, Paul. I know you spent a lot of time on this. And we certainly appreciate the effort, you know. Um, honestly, it, that's what keeps the college going. The, I'm often amazed the amount of effort, time and effort, perhaps you're not aware of it, that many of our speakers put in on these. And uh, we don't often realize that. Nevertheless, here I'm going to be eclectic as usual. Uh, this thing about virtue uh, goes back to the Romans. They had this concept of Stoicism uh, in the Roman Senate, and uh, they were all men of virtue. And the laws that were passed by the Roman for the Roman people were all based on virtue. It, it was an ideal, perhaps not always achieved. Obviously, I. When any time I hear the phrase, we've got to get back to what the founders intended, I say, here we go, boys and girls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, let me tell you, I just spoke about the revolution, so it's fresh in my mind. Let me tell you what the founders <coughs> faced at that period of time. The revolution was over. And they often spoke about it among themselves, which I guess your author never came across any of this. They had a great deal of discussion at the time, what they called the mob. They said the mob has many heads but no brains. Uh, immediately after the American Revolution, which had taken about 25 or 26,000 lives, these people fought pretty desperately for this freedom that they got. Indentured servitude as a labor organizer, I know this, virtually disappeared from the United States. They had a military which they were prone to elect their own officers, unlike the British military, which they had just kicked out of the country. And they had a very strong dislike for the British aristocracy and that kind of social stratification. Compliments of guys like Tom Paine and some other wild fanatics that were out there. Um, they also had faced the Continental Congress, also had faced, a lot of people don't realize this, there were two, if not three, very serious mutinies in, of the American Army. And they were going to march on, on Congress, and this was very much in their minds. It started again after the revolution was over, such as Shays Rebellion, but it spread throughout the colonies because the money was no good. People were losing their homes or if their farms. And so this was spreading across the entire 13 colonies. This was a serious issue, in which they were fully aware of it. They had just fought a war, and, and their reward for it was to be made homeless. And this was the time when they were land-hungry people, nine out of ten, ten owned land. So this was a serious issue. But that's what the founders called the, con the convention together for, to address that issue. And to say that out of that came freedom is nonsensical and does not know the, the situation under which they gathered to put together the government. It was, in many respects, for self-protection. And it was also for the benefit of the people. It was going to be reduced into chaos. Now, yeah, let's see, you know, let's jump to some other things here. Oh, patriotism and civic virtue. I heard a lot of this, I'm sorry. And I will quote the late K. Myers, and we agreed on this one thing all the time. K. said, um, she didn't like flags. That's, that's what first came to mind. She said she didn't like flags because flags only cause problems. And I think patriotism and civic virtue, especially when it's inculcated in our young people, would cause a lot of problems. Also, this notion of civic education falls back on the old thing that education is the solution to everything. No, it is not. It is a convenient thing at the college to believe that it may be, but it isn't. Now, regarding all of this and this guy here, I'm just going to have to tell you, you know, I had another friend, I'll quote my partner Paul, in praying, he said, you know, it's not a government of the people, by the people. 
And for the people, he said, it's just the government. And that's what we've got. And we have a government of laws and statutes, and they make good or bad and what have you. Now, he takes some shots here in this book, and I caught this. He didn't like the progressives. He seemed to think that the progressive movement, probably the only bright thing in our nation's history, he didn't like if I'm correct, because the progressives came along at the time when there was terrible stratification, much like we're having today between the haves and the have-nots, and the progressives addressed this, and I don't understand why he's got a problem with that. Then he's also got a problem, and I have to agree with Margaret here, that he has a problem also, and he says, and I wrote this down, that, oh my God, there was a secularization of the Constitution in the 20th century. Well, isn't that too bad? <laughs> <laughs> if that's what's happened, I'm glad for it. Anyhow, we gave us a lot to think about here. Thank you very much, Phil, and get working on your next one then, Paul. Well, I got one in the works. All right. Keep it here, Mike, and you're right. <laughs> I know. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank Paul for, I read about half of that book and skimmed the other half in the last week, and I thought you did an excellent job, you know, summarizing the essence of what this author talked about. And it's, uh, it's a book that's very pertinent for what's happening in America today. Uh, incidentally, uh, I'll reintroduce myself again. I'm Andy Anderson, and my hobby is collecting and translating books on blacked out subjects, things that reporters can get fired for writing about in America. The human, I made a few notes here while I was thinking, people live, you know, 70, 80 years on average, something like that. So a decade is maybe one seventh or one eighth year life or something like that. And when, as you get older, a decade will just blow by. Seems like yesterday, a couple of years, and 10 years has gone by. Let's take a, a brief look at what's happened, you know, since 2000. That's uh, 13 years, actually. In the last, you know, in the last 12 to 13 years, we've had 60,000 factories closed down, several million jobs, good-paying jobs, closed down here and open in foreign countries. Uh, Middle-class jobs for students coming out of college are not in this country anymore. And within another year, we get another college-educated group uh, graduate next year and come home and can't even get hired at McDonald's. We're heading towards some kind of public awareness that something is radically wrong in America. We're spending a trillion dollars a year on 800 military bases around the world. You know, rough numbers. A trillion dollars a year going down the military rat hole spent by 5% of the world's population. We're spending a million dollars a year it's a million dollars a year per troop to keep a troop in Afghanistan. Well, I say take a hundred thousand dollars a year and send that kid to Harvard and take the other nine hundred thousand and start spending it on public infrastructure, homeless, uh, medical care for people that can't afford it. A whole lot could be done with a trillion dollars a year. That's one big elephant in the room that nobody's talking about in the American media. We have, we're told we have a black president, but he has created truly the first Wall Street government in the history of this country. If you didn't know, if you had never seen a, a picture of President Obama, you would certainly not, it wouldn't be in your, in your wildest expectations, you wouldn't think he has anything in common with black people or brown people or you know, African American people. Exactly. If you had not seen the color of the skin of Clarence Thomas, you would not know that he's a black man. And uh, public housing in this country. Uh, in 1980, uh, they started really changing the shape of America by defunding public housing at the same time they were transferring that money over to the building of prisons. The, uh, our prison complex uh, construction project is the largest on the planet. 
the United States is number one by a very wide margin in the percentage of people that are incarcerated at over almost three million now, something like that. It used to be 300,000 in 1980 when Ronald Reagan was elected. Uh, that other book I held up earlier, The New Jim Crow, uh, describes the policy of mass incarceration that allows the, the, uh, the racist people to put a label on somebody. Now, you can say today, and uh, we don't discriminate against African American people. They're felons. Uh, it's the same kind of discrimination that used to go on for 150 years against uh, a different class of people. So uh, it's not just African Americans either. It's uh, poor minorities. Uh, massive discrimination is going on in this country with the voting laws and everything else. If people are convicted of any kind of crime and then serve a little time, get out, and they're, they're discriminated against for the rest of their lives. We, uh, how much time is left? Anybody yeah, keeping time? Minutes. Minutes? Take a minute. Two minutes? Yes. Um, the middle class in America has been solidly under attack since 1980, so with the election of what is referred to as St. Ronald Reagan. Well, what people don't realize is that Reagan wasn't really the president. He was an actor play acting at the role of the president while the real dirty work was being done by the Bush crime family. And the Bush crime family ran the country all from 1980 to 1992, and they turned it over to Bill Clinton for eight years. We were told we had a Democratic president. Well, Bill Clinton was one of the best Republican presidents in the history of this country, modern times. NAFTA, free trade rules, the loss of jobs, the end of welfare as we know it, uh, the attack on the poor, all these things got started along, on Clinton's watch along with the deregulation of Wall Street. Right now, we're, we're, in our, we're in our 13th year of the Bush-Cheney military policies. That's another big, the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. I'll leave you with this one final note. I've got a couple copies of this book. I ordered more. They were just delivered. Anybody wants to buy one of these things? This is a history book of the last 40 years. It's called Another 19. This is a history of 19 people that governed our country uh, from 2000 to 2008. It's their 40 year history of what these people were doing leading up to when they were installed in the Bush administration which turned out to be the most successful eight-year crime spree in the history of our country. So if you want to know current history, what's happening, and what we can do to take the country back, get a copy of this book or get a copy of uh, Censored News. Uh, we've talked about that before. Uh, come see me if you want a list of uh, references, any of these things. I'll be sitting over there. Thank you. Who's next? It's an open mic. Bob, I think you're up next. Okay. All right, Li Ping. My name is Li Ping Yuan, and uh, thank you for Paul uh, bringing this uh, interesting topic. Actually, I had no idea what virtue is before you talk, and I was asking Bob. Uh, now I have some uh, idea about virtue, at least one version of virtue. I think virtue is uh, too idealistic. It's a dream. It's uh, up in the air. It's hard to follow. It's hard to uh, be practical or executable. So uh, we can talk about that like that, like uh, just like a religion. It's uh, up in the air, and uh, I don't know how really how how to affect me and other people. So it's hard for me to think of virtual than try to find a way to build a society, build a system. And uh, also on the other hand, uh, the freedom. Uh, I think freedom, I understand that most of people talking about freedom is political freedom. Uh, free from a dictatorship, free from uh, old time uh, the king or the royal family and uh, all, all those things. Nowadays, probably we try to free from all the uh, all the rich people, one percent. Uh, that's a very big danger nowadays. We we may lose freedom from that. 
Uh, another thing is I, I really, uh, so freedom to me is more like a social freedom. After I was born, I have no freedom. Uh, everything had to be taken care of by my parents. I have to listen to my parents all the time. And uh, until I go to school, I have to listen to the teachers. And uh, then uh, I don't have much freedom, uh, although I have uh, a little bit more. I can ride a bicycle to wherever a neighbors. Uh, and uh, until after I got my drive license, I got more freedom and I can I can be very happy and uh, after 18 I, I can uh, be uh, really free from my parents. Uh, so about uh, 20 years old, you, after you got all the degrees, you find a job, you probably have most freedom you want. Uh, at that time it's uh, really a free person. But after that, if you want to actually get a job, uh, you, you have to listen to your boss, and uh, you don't have uh, that much freedom on that side. And uh, until you find uh, uh, your partner, you get married, and uh, then uh, you, you notice your freedom is gone. Is gone. Well, not completely gone, but there's uh, much less. Uh, until you got the children, then their freedom is really gone, and uh, and uh, you they, they take your money away, then uh, they they may not follow your order, and uh, uh, all those things happens until like uh, the the children are becomes independent, then you get some freedom back, but not all. So freedom to me, it's uh, it's uh, it's. Descriptor is not really something good or bad, and uh, I, I I would like to looking for. I'm not really looking for more freedom. If I'm looking for more freedom, I, I won't get married. I won't have children. Okay, I just live by myself. Maybe find an island in the Pacific Ocean, and then say, Hey, I got all the freedom. I can do everything. I can smoke. I can do whatever I want to do on the island by by myself. That's how you got all the freedoms. But in a society, you don't have much freedom. Uh, so freedom is not what I'm looking for. Uh, that's more social freedom instead of the political freedom. Uh, but those social freedom nowadays uh, may, may disappear also. If you live in the island on the Pacific Ocean, uh, you will find the island is uh, getting smaller and smaller. One day it uh, will be uh, uh, the ocean level will rise and uh, you may lose the island. So uh, maybe go to another planet. Thank you. <laughs> okay. It's an open mic. <laughs> go to another planet. My <laughs> uh, name is uh, Bob, and uh, uh, <clears> the <throat> topic is truly huge and enormous and very hard to tackle in any way whatsoever. <clears throat> but it's also very vital and very urgent because I think the um, issue of freedom also leads to the economy. Um, <clears throat> And uh, we had big problems with both. Enormous, terrible problems, with only prospects of getting worse. I'm sure we got a good summary of this book. With um, the horrible title, very misleading. <laughs> IVP Press. <laughs> Probably self-published and gave it his own title. Three People Suicide. We're not really talking about suicide at all. Um, although we might all be uh, thinking about it if we keep going the way we're going, straight down the toilet. Mm. Um, yeah, it was a good summary, I'm sure. But the book itself, if it was, that was an accurate summary, it's extremely vague. Um, at least many basic terms undefined, all of them, and didn't define a single term. Faith, virtue, no clue, no clue. 
No, he didn't define his freedom. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't mention uh, <clears throat> any other freedoms. What freedoms was he talking about? With freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to own property. Um, none of the freedoms were specified. There was a distinction drawn between positive and negative freedoms. I didn't mention any specific freedom either in the book, anyhow. <clears throat> uh, the summary of the book. Um, but a main problem today is certainly uh, our lack of virtue. Um, uh, we have all, our society, our society, not, not all of us, but our society as a whole. Oh, by the way, I think a bigger problem than the um, lack of virtue is our basic ignorance about big ideas. We don't have any clue about those whatsoever. Um, no agreement, nothing but subjective, totally relative opinions. Um, um, uh, I think that's a bigger problem uh, today, and I'm working more on that one than the political problem. I don't think you can, there's hardly anything I can do about the political problem <clears throat> on any level. Totally frustrating. Um, to try and do anything about that. Uh, you're, you're preaching to nobody listening. <laughs> you have no power whatsoever to do anything. Uh, and no prospect to give you any. Um, but okay, back to virtue. Uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're declining greatly in virtue. Um, <clears throat> uh, our standards of personal conduct and behavior are deteriorating significantly. There's no doubt about it. Just look at any media. And you can see it in all areas, a swift decline. Um, well, a big one anyhow. Um, we're becoming very weak, very self-indulgent, extremely greedy, and that leads to the economic problem. Huge economic problem, and it's getting worse every day. Pretty much. I mean, I mean, the schools, they, they got hit hard this year. Next year, so it's going to be much worse. And it's going to get worse every year. Unless there's a big turnaround somewhere. I don't see it coming anywhere. Um, all right, so how do you build virtue in a person? <laughs> and build character? Oh, man. I don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody ever knew. Um, it's a big, tremendous job. Aristotle tackled it in his ethics and politics. I won't bore you with a summary. The main thing he said is you need to teach children, you know, to model, um, model behavior on ideal characters. But what, where are you going to find one in our society today? <laughs> They can find a few. They can find some on the social level. No, I don't have much time for questions, sorry. Oh, you have a joke? Or a... No, I was volunteering as a... Oh, you're volunteering. All right, everyone follow Charlie. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know how you, you make people virtuous. Uh, I know a lot of ways you don't make people virtuous. You haven't followed the laws, like the laws of Florida. You can get away with murder, man. If you follow those laws, <clears throat> um, how are they our virtues? Our laws are terrible. They favor the rich. They favor lawyers tremendously, just like in every other country. Maybe a little less here, but they're still pretty bad here. Um, you don't preach virtue because um, it's too important. You'll just turn people off. Uh, and it, and um, it's certainly not being done in public schools. <laughs> it, it, could it? Should it? Uh, they're teaching to the test. And from my observation, public schools, they don't care at all what's going on in your head. You know, about you as a thinking individual. As, as a self-respecting person, they could care less about that. They're just trying to get a high grade so they can get their funds. Um, they don't care about the mind, the development of the mind, critical, creative thinking. They, 
There's a small movement in virtue in some schools, private schools. Um, <clears throat> I think this is extremely controversial, but the teaching of religion does teach people to think about the big questions in life. You know, it does scare a lot of people about hell, sure. And at least they're behaving. That's not the best motivation, certainly. But it's really hard to find something in uh, pure secularism to believe in these days. That's, that's, that's really hard, too. So, um, what's my answer? <laughs> wow, well, wow. I don't know. What, what's the question? I'm not sure what the question was. Uh, how do you prevent free people from committing suicide? That's the question. <laughs> you mean that literally? Of course not, no. Uh, I don't have an answer. Um, uh, all I could say is we have to somehow care about virtue and care about the big ideas, but nobody, nobody really knows about that. Hi. He was next to see. Frank, do you care about uh, the no, question? You couldn't tell I was wrapping really up? Uh, you know, we have some very religious atheists uh, who are uh, devoted to denouncing religion. Uh, well, there's a whole lot of religion that should be denounced. You know, we wouldn't have... Uh, uh, Judaism or Christianity without denouncing the uh, religions uh, that <coughs> were not living up to what the Hebrews found was necessary to survive and to uh, be a people to have to be able to count on each other Uh, we wouldn't have a, a Christian, Christianity without people looking for somebody who was better, somebody who had hope, uh, somebody who gave them hope, uh, someone who was faithful even to the death. Yeah. They found it in uh, Jesus the Christ. And if you can find someone who is an example of the virtue you look for, God bless you. Uh, people have found it in, uh, in Buddha, uh, a guy who was wise and concerned. And they found it in Confucius, uh, who uh, had some idea of what a good family ethic and good social relations might be. And they found it in, uh, in Socrates, who demanded that you ask questions, keep analyzing and looking for an answer. Yeah, there are different virtues. There are virtues. And if you really look for a virtuous life, my God, you're religious. <laughs> It's an open mic. It's next. You mentioned it? I'm really sorry I missed this talk. I was looking forward to it. Um, you can read the book. It's all there. <laughs> From um, the questions about freedom and stuff, I did have something I wanted to, to add to the, to the discussion. Or, and what it is is that I knew, I knew a man who would have been 90s, in his early 90s, had he, if he was alive today. And this man had traveled the world as a merchant mariner and had seen cultures everywhere. 
And one day during a discussion, he said to me, I've been all over the world, and the only freedom I've ever seen is the freedom to agree with those around you. He says, if you ever do anything other than that, it's life becomes difficult. And the thing about this country is it's, it's tolerance. It's, it's the ability to not have violence with so many different opinions. Um, and it's just amazing. All right, thank you. The speaker gets the last word. Okay, now I can get up here and talk as me. <laughs> I want to start by apologizing to everyone here. This was not my best effort. I know I read most of it, and that was not my intention. I've been actually working on this speech for three three months. Uh, three weeks ago, I had the unfortunate happening of uh, actually finding nine to five work. And that cut into my preparation time quite a bit. <laughs> I had hoped to refine my outline a little more. And another thing, when I when I got up here today, I set my notes down. I normally just glance through my, use my notes as an outline and just go along. But I looked down and I said, it's so dark, I can't see anything. So I had to hold it up so I can see it. And. While I agree with most of what the author said, I was trying to portray his opinions, not mine. And I apologize, him. I apologize to the author if I did misrepresent him at all. And all the quotes I used were given by the author in the book. He has references and everything showing where he got all this from. So, And there are many, many, many more quotes in the book. He, he was big on Montesquieu and Tocqueville and others of that era. I feel all these comments you made on virtue proves one of the author's points. <laughs> that virtue means absolutely nothing to people in this country today. That was one of his points. You can't fake virtue, which is what they've done in the past in this country. We use fake virtue, we copy it, we fake it because that doesn't work now, because virtue means absolutely nothing to most people in this country. And he's not saying it's an easy process to change. He admits in the book, it is a very long and difficult process to do the change that's necessary. But if we don't start now, if it is not already, it may be too late to reverse. He did say a lot about the Congress and money. He, he used the word plutocracy because money is buying everything. Money is our God these days. He also mentioned about time, time and technology. The more and more we're becoming dependent upon time, the less and less time we have to do anything. I started my technology career back in the 80s when I was in college. And back then they promised us two things. We'd have a paperless office, which never happened for two reasons back at that time. Number one, the courts did not accept digital information as evidence. It had to be print, original print. And number two, computers have just made it so much easier to make so much more paper. <laughs> and these people passing along technology promised us, oh, we're going to have so much leisure time when the computers take over everything. Does anybody have more leisure time than they did 30 years ago? <laughs> I, cer I, I certainly didn't as of my own will. I mean, when I was unemployed for six months, I had plenty of leisure time. And I want, to, I want to say things. We talked about religion and faith. He doesn't bring this out in the book. But 
I want to try and clarify this a little bit. Religion and faith are not, at least to me, the same thing. Religion is the customs and traditions. Religion is going to church and reading the Bible and doing your Hail Marys or whatever. It is the traditions, the customs. It is not faith. Faith, faith, faith is a conviction. It is a trust. It is a belief in whatever it is you're having your faith in. It can be God, it can be money, it can be whatever. I've also heard said there are no, there is no such thing as an atheist. An atheist is someone with no God. Everybody has a God of some sort. To a lot of atheists, their God is being an atheist. <laughs> what a bullshit repeat. Huh? Yeah. They keep going over and the same circle. thing. Personally, I don't try to be a good person because I'm afraid to go to hell. Or because I want to earn my way to heaven, which is quite impossible anyway. I'm a good person because in my beliefs, my faith, God has given me everything. And I'm just giving back of what he gave to me. That is my belief. And if people were motivated more like that, um, the author talks a lot about the common good. If our elected representatives, no matter how they got there, whether they bought their way or not, were more interested in the common good than in their private agendas, the country would be much better off. And quite frankly, I assume most of the people here were atheists. And uh, hitting that topic, that's why I mentioned what the author had to say about, a little bit of what the author had to say about atheists, because I figured most of you would be saying here, well, this faith in religion means nothing to me. And he acknowledges that atheists can be good persons. He's not saying that. That's nice. <laughs> I didn't know education that. <laughs> is not the solution but it would be a good start <coughs> and the gentleman here I, 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 I agree with what he said but he talked a lot about negative freedom the freedom from freedom from this freedom from this freedom from this but we also have the positive freedom we're not just free from things we're free for excellence we're Free, we are free for improving ourselves. We are free for, free to do better. And I, I was following along with what he was saying. He was talking about, well, when I was a child, I had to listen to my parents. That's a very virtuous thing. You listen to your parents or you face the consequences. When he went to school, when he went to school, he had to do his homework. He had to listen to his teachers. He didn't have to do that. He chose to do that. That is, I think that is the virtue that the author is looking for. When he went to college, and he got, well, when you got a car, he chose to follow the laws. He didn't have to. You can go out and drive your car as fast as you want. You have freedom. But we choose to reasonably follow the traffic laws. And that, I think, is what the author is meaning by virtue. I put a note here, and I'm not sure what it means. And, and virtue is not gone. What we need is not necessarily virtue, but self-restraint. We are free. You're free. You can go out and do anything. I can take a gun and start shooting people all over the place. It's my freedom. But, you know, you're going to have to face the consequences eventually. It's the self-restraint. I, I, I think a, 
a great of it is, the author's trying to say, is the self-restraint is what's missing in this country. Yeah, and that's why it's going crazy. <laughs> the best way to figure it all out and find out what he was trying to say would be to pick up the book yourself and read it. And like I said, you can get it uh, $15 at Amazon. I'm, I would be willing to say you might be able to find it at the library. You could probably find transcripts of it at, um, online. If you search Oz, Goodis, Oz Guinness on Google, I found a, he has a page about the book with some interview quotes from him. And I, I'd like to thank you all for your comments and everything, and I will be back. No, oh, good. Yes. And that's a wrap tonight. Thank you all for coming. From and again, we'll be here next week. I would doubt if you can't. I, I would be surprised if it didn't have it there. I got mine on Amazon. <laughs> means nothing to a heathen. Okay? And the biggest heathen is what I see now is texting while driving.